Chancellor Radio Productions presents, in association with Bucket Knot Media Productions and Squatch Film, The Tragedy of the Helios, an audio production in four parts, written by Matt Whitney. Episode 1, Terra Australis, November 22nd, 1935. My dear Sophia, I have missed you so these last months at sea and the children. I think of you often to pass the long hours and days since we set sail from Cape Horn. Dr. David Klosterman sat hunched over a small table, writing his letter. He was middle-aged, with a beard he had only grown for the Antarctic cold. He found it scratchy and uncomfortable. His conditions were cramped and cluttered. Mercifully, he had his own cabin, but tall as he was, it made standing impossible. Save for a bed and the table he occupied, there was no furniture. In its place was no shortage of wooden shipping crates, their contents the myriad of instruments Klosterman and his colleagues would use for their research. I curse myself daily that I did not bring more books. There is nothing to do on this accursed ship. I can walk it bow to stern at fifty paces, and the only sight is endless ocean. Klosterman paused to glance out his grimy porthole window at the rollicking sea. Salty spray hit the thick glass. Though the fog was thick this afternoon, Klosterman thought he spotted a small ship bobbing in the distance. Of course, the notion was ridiculous. They were more than a thousand miles from any land but the Antarctic coast. Unlike poor Dr. Astor, I find the waves to be quite calming and would be content to stay in my chambers day and night reading but I exhausted my material many weeks ago, and now I must pass the hours studying charts with Astor between his bouts of vomiting. Klosterman crossed out the last word and considered a more sanitary alternative. Disquietude. Once again, Klosterman looked out onto the sea. No longer a phantom, he could clearly see a two-masted sloop on a path towards the Helios. He wondered to himself, why such a vessel was so far from civilization. Putting the boat out of his mind, Klosterman returned to the letter. I must confess a certain uneasiness that has been growing in my mind. Tomorrow, we reach Camp Samuelson, where I fear some great calamity will befall us all. David, are you awake? The captain wants to see us on deck. The deck of the Helios, an 80-foot sailing vessel with four skyscraping masts and innumerable canvas sails that stood out on the cold blue of the sea. On the bow, the ship's name was emblazoned in red, and a wooden statue of the Greek god Helios, crowned with the sun, served as the figurehead. Doctors Klosterman and Astor came topside, in view of the rough crew of the Helios. They were not unwelcome with the crew, but their civilized appearance, academic minds, and soft hands left little in common with the sea-worn sailors. Boys! From his position at the helm, Captain Mosley yelled it down to the professors. He was exactly what you would expect an Antarctic sailing captain to be, with a thick beard down to his belly, skin that had seen several lifetimes of sun, and a heavy coat made of whale hide. Get up here! Astor exchanged a look with Klosterman. Mosley was a gruff man, but never pushy, and never rude to his passengers. How can we be of service? Mosley shoved a spyglass into Klosterman's hand and pointed wordlessly to the east, the same direction where the ship had appeared earlier. Klosterman hesitated to use the spyglass, knowing what he would find. Closing in alarmingly quickly was the sloop. Its sails were a pale yellow and had seen far better days. More your signs as friends? No. Dr. Mackenzie would be coming from the west, and he'd be in a much bigger vessel. That's what worries me. What does? Klosterman handed Astor the spyglass. About that small, they probably lost. Probably needs rescuing. Do you think it could be Ellen Shaw? Even she wouldn't be foolish enough to sail a boat that small in these seas. Whoever's they are, I want you two talking to them. Mosley wagged a sausage-sized finger at them. Why us? He thinks they'll find us less intimidating. No, he thinks they'll shoot us first when they board. Is that possible? Could they be pirates? 
this far out, who'd they be robbing from? Captain, ship spotted due east. The quartermaster called down from the crow's nest. He was a sinewy man, red-haired and covered in exotic tattoos. Well spotted. Hurry down to receive them. Thank you. You'll still be saying hello. Just don't want them thinking it's only sissies on board. Mosley guffawed to himself. He patted both men on the backs to let them know that, while he wholeheartedly believed his statement, it was all in good fun. We expected trouble, Captain. No, likely's off course is all. The men didn't have to wonder long, for within a few minutes the small vessel had pulled alongside them. Signs of old age and neglect were everywhere. Cracks in the hull had been shoddily patched with tar. Any remnants of paint had long since sloughed off, leaving sun-bleached wood. The sails were not canvas, but a thicker, unknown material. They had not held up to the salt spray well, and it was a miracle they still propelled the boat. At the helm was the only visible occupant, a bone-thin man with wispy hair and worn clothes. He looked as if he had been out to sea for years. Well met, my friends. Can we be of assistance? Mosley glowered at Klosterman, not wanting to offer aid unless necessary. Why are you here? We're scientists on a research expedition. Are you here the eclipse? Yes, we're astronomers. Klosterman whispered to his colleague. How does he know about the eclipse? Dr. Astor seemed unperturbed by this. Are you here to observe the eclipse as well? The eclipse is not for your eyes. Excuse me? Turn back now. You are not welcome here. The Johnny does not welcome you. The captain returned to his command, steering his small boat away from the Helios. Hey, sir! Identify yourself! Where do you make port? The quartermaster raged down the deck as the mysterious vessel sailed away. Klosterman stared at the retreating boat. Through the small window into the hull, he could see figures in black robes moving about. Everyone on board turned to the first mate at the bow. Large vessel docked offshore. Must be Mackenzie. How did he arrive ahead of us? I have no idea. Perhaps he can shed some light on our visitor. The professors watched the boat disappear into thick, gathering fog. Tomorrow, they would reach the Antarctic mainland and start their journey to the South Pole. Rough waves crashed against the rocky Antarctic coast. The sea was determined to not let the two rowboats full of passengers and supplies traverse from the Helios to the shore. Klosterman pulled his coat tight, tucked his chin against the biting cold and salt air. He watched as the quartermaster and his companions rode hard against the tempest. David. Dr. Astor nudged Klosterman as he pointed towards the shore, where several simple buildings stood. Why is everything so still? Klosterman squinted through the gale at the seemingly empty buildings. While it was to be expected for everyone to be inside, there were no signs of life in the windows. Perhaps they're still aboard the Leo. Behind them, a massive steel research vessel bobbed in the rough waters. It, too, had no signs of life. Would they not have signaled us if they were aboard? Perhaps. Both men sat back, hunched against the cold and wet. They watched as the crew fought the sea, inching towards the coast. Base camp was a ghost town. Astor's suspicions were correct, as no sign of life was anywhere. Dr. McKenzie! Dr. McKenzie! Klosterman peered through a snow-covered window into the storeroom. Paul! Over here! Are they inside? The quartermaster rushed over and tried the locked door. Looks completely deserted. Why is it locked? Splintering wood gave way to the quartermaster's boot as he kicked in the front door. The professors and crew followed him in to find the storeroom empty. Bare shelves and empty crates were all that was left of supplies meant to take them to the South Pole and back. Where's all the food? 
The supplies. Do you think they went ahead without us? Never. Why would they leave early? The plan was to depart on the 24th. The quartermaster checked for any overlooked food. What's your plan now? Are we to row you back? No, no, not yet. Please let us think. Aster and Klosterman were left alone in the storeroom while the crew went to search the remaining buildings. I don't like this at all, Stephen. Nor do I. Do you think that boat had anything to do with it? That man had not been eating well. He hasn't been here. Someone has. And I'd like to know who before we decide what to do next. Good morning, gentlemen. Through the door stepped Ellen Shaw. She may have been mistaken for a man in her utilitarian clothing, if not for removing her balaclava upon entering. The men in the storeroom turned to her, taken aback at an unexpected visitor. Miss Shaw, when did you arrive? We only saw Mackenzie's boat. I put into port 30 miles up the coast, and arrived here by sled last night. Why not dock here? There was a penguin colony I wanted to photograph. Klosterman shook his head at Shaw's antics, which were not out of character. Once, some years ago, he had bumped into her while on holiday in the Turkish Republic. He was there on leisure. She, to climb Mount Ararat. Was Mackenzie here when you arrived? No. We rode out to the Leo, but it was deserted. It looks like he left for the relief camp already. But why would he leave without us? We have no way of following him. You didn't bring dogs? We expected to use Mackenzie's. Well, I brought dogs. Enough to share. Food, too. We set up in the bunkhouse. The professors followed Shaw from the storehouse to the nearby bunkhouse. Chained up outside were a dozen sled dogs who pulled at their restraints, ready to blaze across the tundra. Half a dozen of Shaw's crew milled about outside, readying the sleds for departure. They seemed unfazed by the brutal weather. Shaw led them inside, which was not much warmer, but was, thankfully, out of the wind. While there was much to plan and discuss, one question burned at the front of Klosterman's, and no doubt Aster's mind. Hello. Did you see any other vessels when you pulled into port? Or while you traveled up the coast? No. Are you expecting other colleagues? No. We were approached by a small boat yesterday, and a man warning us away from the shore. Did he say where he was from? No. He sailed off without a word. Shaw twisted her hands, considered for a moment before speaking. I did see something on my way here. The doctors urged her on. Two days ago, we were cresting a ridge. I was the first one over the top, and when I looked down, there was a crowd of black-robed figures. Who were they? I have no idea. I turned away to call to someone, and when I turned back, they were gone. It was probably a trick of the light. The three of them stood in silence a moment, none of them wanting to explore the subject further. How do we proceed from here? Full steam ahead. I have the supplies and the dogs to get us to the relief camp. There's no reason to believe we won't meet Mackenzie there. And if we don't, right now we have a ship waiting for us. Then we resupply and carry on. If he never made it to the base camp, then there will be more than enough. And if he did, and already moved on? Then we pray he was kind enough to leave us something. The day passed without incident as everything was readied for departure the next day. Night never exactly fell in Antarctica this time of year, but gloomy cloud cover dampened the sunny cheer of earlier. Klosterman leaned against a wall, watching the crew making merry in the center of the room. The stocky cook, Salman, passed out sandwiches from a tray, eventually making his way to Klosterman. No, thank you. Are you feeling ill? Even if I weren't agitated, Meat and I do not exactly agree. Please, do not worry, sir. We've already been traveling in this environment for a week. We will get you safely to your destination. I'm sure you will. That's not what worries me. Salman stayed by Klosterman, inviting him to continue. Did you witness anything unusual on your journey? In what way? I see he many unusual things traveling with Miss Shaw. Have you ever heard of Sashane? Sashane is the angry son. Klosterman was wholly unaware of such a being and was confused to be met with such certainty from the man. Sashane and Haster were brothers. Two great lights in the night sky. Both shined brightly but Haster shined brighter of the two. 
This made Sashine envious, and he plotted to usurp his younger brother. One day, while Hoster was making his way across the sky, Sashine cast him down to Earth, where he landed in a great lake that extinguished his brilliant light. Now, Hoster waits, trapped in a watery tomb while his brother watches him endlessly from the heavens. And what would happen if Hoster escaped his prison? He would take to battle against his brother in the sky, and the destruction they wrought would consume the earth in fire. Antarctica, the final frontier. It was barely a century prior that Davis had made landfall, less than a quarter that time since Amundsen reached the South Pole. Yet any evidence that mankind had ever set foot in this white abyss had been blown away, replaced by endless white in every direction, the horizon flat all around. The expedition set out on the morning of the 24th of November, nine souls in all. Klosterman, Astor, and Shaw each shared a sled with two of her crew members. The dogs made good time across the endless tundra, flagging only at midday when the team stopped to eat quickly and secure their cargo. How many days are we from the relief camp? If we keep this pace, five days. Can we keep this pace? Salmon? Salmon looked up from his preparation of their cold meat and bread. If the ground stays level, yes. The dogs are healthy and our fortune is holding. Little did Salmon know that their fortune had already turned for the worse. A few hours after their stop for lunch, the lead sled dog got loose and ran off into the tundra. The rest of the pack tried to follow, and though unsuccessful, they succeeded in upending one of the sleds and spilling the contents of another. After riding the sled and repacking everything, no one was keen on spending hours riding through the blistering cold. Camp was struck and they hunkered down in hopes of a better tomorrow. But the next day brought even greater misfortune. While crossing over what seemed like solid ground, a thin sheet of ice gave way to a deep crevasse. Shaw's sled plummeted into the black chasm along with all its supplies and both crew members. Shaw only survived by leaping from the sled and scaling several feet out of the crevasse. We're ruined. That was all of our food. And two of my men! Klosterman stepped forward to break up the impending fight. Do we have any food left? If we ration, I have enough food on my sled to get us to the relief camp. If we don't run into any more obstacles. And if we do? <laughs> then we eat the dogs. All we have to do is make it to the relief camp. November 27th. Three days had passed since the deaths of two crew members and four sled dogs. In those days, the team had made precious little progress. Hundreds of miles still lay between them and the relief camp, and their food was running dangerously low. Salmon rationed their supplies well, but it was inevitable that they would run out long before they reached Mackenzie, if he was even there to rescue them. Curse this godforsaken lady. Aster shouted this to no one in particular, and was immediately answered when the sled wedged in a crack in the ice, throwing him onto the hard ground along with his companions. Are you all right? Klosterman <laughs> hurried towards Aster as Shaw slowed the second sled. Aster lay on the ground, moaning in pain. His leg was clearly broken. Help me get this out of the ice before it breaks! Shaw rallied the crew around the sled, and they went to work, digging the sled out of the ice before it snapped under its weight. Can you move? I'm not sure. Klosterman tried to help Aster to his feet, but he immediately collapsed back onto the snow with a howl of pain. One, two, three, lift! The crew did their best to lift the heavy sled out of the ice, and for a moment, their success seemed assured. But then, the sled crashed back to the ground, groaning under the weight. Don't move. You need a split. Klosterman turned back to the crew, just as their second attempt to free the sled ended in a sickening crunch of wood. The sled sheared off, leaving a broken mess, unable to move or repair. No! Ellen lost her composure, raged at the sled, the snow, at God himself. The rest of the crew sat down, 
resigned to whatever fate their fearless leader had brought them to. Sunrise the next morning brought the news that two dogs had frozen to death. The only comfort in such news was that they wouldn't have to kill another dog for nourishment for some time now. The crew worked together to stack as much equipment as possible on the remaining sled, while still leaving enough room for Dr. Astor, who was unable to walk. The rest of the team would have to continue on foot, slowing their already tedious pace to a crawl. Klosterman walked close to Shaw, speaking with her in low tones that the rest of the crew could not hear. What are the chances we reach the relief camp before we run out of dogs to eat? We have no other option. I've not lived this long to starve to death. And when we reach the relief camp, what then? I'm not even hopeful Mackenzie will be there. You can do what you like. I plan to continue on to the South Pole. I worry Stephen can't make the trip. The return trip would be equally arduous. And then what? You have a thousand miles of ocean before you reach anyone who could help him? Say we do continue on. Where do we get more dogs? If there aren't more at the relief camp, then we'll go on foot and Aster can wait for us at camp. Klosterman didn't respond. Instead, he stared past Ellen to a point in the distance where black-robed figures marched in a single-file line. David? In response, Klosterman pointed to the figures. Shaw looked with a gasp. Quickly, the spyglass! Salman rushed to pull a spyglass from his pack. With it, Shaw looked closer at the mysterious black-robed figures. What do you see? Shaw scanned the horizon, sweeping back and forth with the spyglass. Nothing. They're gone. She gave the expanse a final look. Wait, I see something. What Shaw had spotted was a marker left by a previous expedition indicating buried supplies. The team made their way to this potential treasure trove and started digging, hoping, at last, for salvation. And so, salvation came in the form of frozen meat, enough to feed them all on their trip, and then some. Salmon gave thanks to the explorers who had left them this bounty, and got to preparing a meal for the bedraggled team of scientists and adventurers. Over the next several days, the explorers trudged along the endless white tundra. Klosterman, Shaw, and now Aster were all seeing black-robed figures on a regular basis, but none of them shared this with the others preferring to slip quietly into insanity. Aster's leg had worsened. Great green bruises spread down his thigh, and though he tried choking down some of the newly discovered meat, he hadn't eaten since breaking his leg. What's wrong with Salman? Salman was bent over double, left behind as the group moved forward without him. He looked about to collapse as he steadied himself with hands on his knees. Salman, are you all right? Shaw headed back towards Salman. Her pace doubled as he began vomiting great quantities of blood. By the time she reached him, Salman was on all fours, atop a ring of slowly spreading crimson. Salman? Salman's body shook with convulsions as bloody foam pooled in his mouth. Someone help me! Shaw turned back to her companions in a desperate plea for help, but was met with a horrifying sight. The rest of her crew and many of the dogs were doubled over with the same symptoms. Moments later, she too was overcome with the mysterious illness, collapsing with Salmon still in her arms. The only person still standing was Klosterman, trapped in the center of the chaos as everyone around him died. December 12th, 1935. It had been almost two weeks since Shaw and her crew had succumbed to what Klosterman could only assume was tainted meat. How it had become so was a mystery, but for once, Klosterman was thankful for his medically mandated vegetarianism. Images of the dying crew, of Shaw, flashed in Klosterman's mind as he trudged step by step through the endless tundra, pulling the last remaining cart. Aster slept on the cart, surrounded by empty supply crates to shelter him from the wind. His chest barely rose. It was clear he would die soon if help was not reached. Only two dogs had survived the poisoned meat, but they died of exhaustion two days later. Klosterman was afraid to eat them in case they too were infected, and because it was now unnecessary, 
what with only two mouths to feed, and one of them barely eating. With only his thoughts for company the last twelve days, Klosterman had turned his mind more and more to the black-robed figures. He had seen them just before they found the meat, but the ground was undisturbed when they arrived. There was no way anyone would have had the time to tamper with the meat. And anyway, Klosterman wasn't convinced the figures were real. The mind invented things when faced with an endless blank canvas of snow. He put away the thought that Shaw had seen the same figures. David. Klosterman whipped around to see Aster checking ahead with the spyglass. Stephen, are you all right? I can see the relief camp. Just ahead, obscured by whipped up snow, was the relief camp. A small building, reinforced against the weather and topped with multicolored flags to guide in travelers. Like Camp Samuelson, no one appeared to be at the relief camp. Klosterman stopped the sled and rushed to the front door. To his surprise, it opened into the small building. Hello. The relief camp was a single room with deep shelves filled with crates on two sides, two triple bunk beds on the back wall, and another on the front next to the door. Is anyone there? McKinsey? No. It's deserted. Klosterman checked the crates, and to his delight, found them full of food, supplies, and medicine. I found supplies. He pulled down a crate full of dried crackers and ripped open a package as he hurried outside to Aster. Both men silently ate and watched the endless tundra swirl about. Do you see a man over there? You're not crazy. I see him too. Through the gathering snow, the professor spotted Dr. McKenzie dancing with his hands lifted skyward. His feet were bare and his clothes far too thin for the icy weather. Dr. McKenzie! McKenzie paid his name no notice. He continued to sway to unheard music, making a circle in the snow. As he danced, he chanted a single word over and over. Sasha. Paul! Klosterman put a hand on Mackenzie's shoulder and turned him around. Once a sturdy, barrel-chested man with thick blonde hair and a cheery disposition, Paul Mackenzie was a shell of his former self. He looked as if he had lived ten years in the last one. What little clothes he wore had the appearance of being several sizes too large for him, when in reality, he had shrunk several sizes. What are you doing out in the snow? Mackenzie took a moment to recognize his colleague. Uh -huh. Here for the eclipse, eh? <laughs> not for your eyes, for mine. No, 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 not for yours. Mindlessly, Mackenzie slipped back into his one-word chant. Come on inside, Paul. Klosterman led Mackenzie back towards the relief camp, but he quickly broke away and returned to his dance. M must, must stay here. Must want the asses. Not for their eyes. Not for your eyes. Not for mine. No, not for mine. They told me no. Ah! Mackenzie fell to the ground, writhing as he cried out. Not for me. I must not look. Not for you. For the asses. He rolled over and buried his face in the snow. Paul, stop. You'll injure you. Klosterman did his best to restrain Mackenzie before he hurt himself or froze to death. Despite his emaciated appearance, Mackenzie was still as strong as a bull and effortlessly shoved Klosterman aside. Ah, I see you! You king! I told you not to you! Mackenzie rounded on Klosterman, tackling him to the ground. They scuffled, neither gaining the upper hand, until Aster, watching helplessly from the sled, hurled the spyglass at Mackenzie. It connected with a thud, and Mackenzie dropped into the snow. Inside the relief camp, Mackenzie sat, tied to a chair. His feet, ears, and nose were blackened with frostbite. Across from him, Klosterman worked on properly mending Aster's leg while he interrogated Mackenzie. Why didn't you wait for us at Camp Samuelson? I had to... I had to see the eclipse. 
I was thinking had to see it, not for lies. Mackenzie pulled against his restraints. But why leave early? Why take all the supplies? Time was ticking, time was ticking. I had to see the eclipse. Couldn't wait any longer. How long did you wait for us? Till they came. Till they told us to leave. Not for our eyes, they said. Not for us. You met an old man in a boat? Look out for Sasha eh? Look out for the angry brother. Where did you hear that name? From the old man? <laughs> Must go to the eclipse. Sasha ne is coming. Not for my eyes. No, not for yours. Coming soon. The eclipse isn't for almost two weeks yet. T t t tomorrow. Coming tomorrow. <laughs> tick tock. Tick tock. Must get to the eclipse. Where's your crew? Gone. To see the eclipse. Not for their eyes, but they looked. <laughs> Sashane gone to Sashane. What does that mean? Are they dead? Missing? Gone. <laughs> gone to Sashane. <laughs> Mackenzie renewed his struggle with the ropes. He's gonna hurt himself. Klosterman turned to Mackenzie just as he tipped his chair over, taking his head on a collision course with the edge of a crate, which cut short his ragged hysterics. Blood poured from the wound, and after a short gasp, he was dead. Aster and Klosterman looked on in horror as the accident unfolded, powerless to stop it. Mackenzie, their last hope, lay dead on the floor, along with any chance of escape. The remainder of the day passed slowly. Klosterman had taken Mackenzie's body outside, but it did nothing to remove his words from the minds of the men. Soon, the oppressive silence gave way to debate on what to do next. We seem out of options, by my estimation. We've plenty of food. Aye, but that matters little when we have no way of leaving here. Do you expect to wait till my leg is healed? No, I, I don't know what we'll do. There's a chance Mackenzie's team left something we can use. Unless they left us dogs somewhere. I don't see it doing us much good. You can't pull me and our supplies hundreds of miles back to I Samuelson. know, Stephen. It looks grim. Dwelling on that serves us nothing. I'm only being realistic. <laughs> Come now. We could be realistic tomorrow. Tonight, we can at least enjoy some food and drink. Klosterman raided various crates, bringing out all sorts of delicacies by Antarctic standards. They even found a bottle of whiskey tucked behind cases of socks. The two men ate and drank and reminisced about their lifetimes of adventure. And for a moment, all thoughts of Mackenzie and of dying and even of Sachinet were put from their mind. The men celebrated their lives until the whiskey was gone and they drifted off to sleep. Sometime later, Klosterman awoke and groggily pushed off the floor. He took a moment to orient his still inebriated mind. Aster? The cot set up for Aster was empty, and there was nowhere else to hide in the square room. Stephen? Klosterman struggled with his winter gear, stumbling about. He ripped open the door onto the blinding white snow. The tundra was completely still and silent. Stephen! The name rang out over the ice to no response. Klosterman turned a circle, but saw nothing save the building. Faintly at first, but steadily growing, came the chant of Sashane. It came from every direction, and a moment later, Klosterman saw why, 
as he was surrounded on all sides by black-robed figures. Hundreds of them materialized on the horizon, closing in a vast circle around Klosterman as they chanted the name of their arcane god. Gradually, darkness spread across the sky as the sun slipped behind the moon. All at once, the circle removed their hoods, revealing faces as hollow as Mackenzie's that looked up to the sky in unison. The onlookers screamed and shouted, beat their bodies and tore their robes. Klosterman turned to take in the full horror of it all. All around him, the robed cultists shouted the name Sashane, even as blood streamed from their eyes, mouths, and ears. Some collapsed in writhing heaps, while others fought to stay standing, even as their bodies gave out. Klosterman's attention shifted from the dead and dying cultists to the eclipse. He reached for the spyglass at his hip, a poor tool for the job, but he had only moments before the celestial event was over. Shoving it to his eye, he looked up to the moon and the halo of sun. Instead, Klosterman beheld a far more awesome sight. A great behemoth god was stretched out in all directions around the moon, clawing at the black void. Its full, incomprehensible size was still behind the lunar rock. Great shafts of light sparked off Sashane as it roiled in the heavens with great fury. On Earth, all was still. A great ring of cultists was spread out over the snow, all contorted and nearly as pale as the snow, save for frozen red trails down their cheeks. In the center of the carnage, Klosterman laid spread out in the snow. The spyglass was still clutched in his hand and held up to a hollow, smoking eye socket. Sunlight washed over the once more uninhabited wasteland that was Antarctica, and in the sky, the angry brother was quiet once more. The Helios cut through the water, leaving behind the Antarctic Peninsula en route to Argentina. Captain Mosley looked back at the receding coastline and could, at a distance, see the eclipse wash over the frozen continent. He pulled his heavy coat around him, but he knew his shiver was not from the cold. The eclipse had given him an uneasy feeling, and somehow, he knew, this would be his last visit to the south. Thank you for listening to The Tragedy of the Helios, an audio production in four parts, written by Matt Whitney. Performances by Tyler Savino, Jordan Mullins, and Stephen Planalp. If you have enjoyed this presentation, please share it with others and subscribe to our channel to be the first to hear about future productions.